Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the Grove. You know, of all the, the places that you could be this morning, all the things that you could be doing, I'm just glad that you chose to be right here with us at the Grove. And I hope that you are too. You know, since I spent last Sunday discussing the uh, philosophical and theological themes of last month's blockbuster superhero movie, I thought I would just continue that theme for another week and talk about this month's blockbuster superhero movie. Uh, which is Captain America Civil War. Uh, and while the, the details differ, but both of these films feature iconic superheroes pitted against one another uh, over ideological differences. You know, in, in Batman vs. Superman, the Dark Knight's distrust of the Man of Steel led to an, an epic battle between DC's two most beloved superheroes. And similarly, in Civil War, Captain America clashes with fellow Avenger, Iron Man. And the movie hasn't actually come out yet. It opens this weekend. Um, Ashley and I are probably going to go see it on Thursday, uh, if not on Friday. And, uh, and so I can't really comment on what's in the movie. But the movie itself is based on a comic series by the same title. And so in the comic series that inspired the movie, Captain America and Iron Man find themselves on opposite sides of a, a heated political issue. The president wants to force superheroes to register and reveal their secret identities and, and basically work for the government. And Iron Man sees it as an opportunity for greater accountability and, and better organization. Captain America, on the other hand, sees it as an infringement on freedom. And so Captain America's decision to oppose Iron Man in the White House fractures the, the whole superhero community and lines are drawn, sides are chosen, and a, a huge battle erupts between the two opposing sides. And while conflicts you know, like these make for enthralling entertainment, the fact remains that when superheroes skirmish, nobody wins. And the same is true for Christians. Unfortunately, conflict among Christians is all too common You know, with more than 200 different denominations in the United States, it seems as though Christians will dispute and divide over just about everything. You know, baptism, gifts of the Spirit, unconditional election, ecclesiastical structure, women's role in the church, homosexuality, evolution, the list just goes on and on and on. All too often we identify ourselves in terms of the particular beliefs that set us apart rather than the beliefs that bind us together with the, the larger Christian community. And it may help us to know that we aren't the first generation of Christians to struggle with disagreements and division. In fact, the, the very first generation of Christians did too. And Paul dealt with that in his first letter to the Corinthians. If you have a Bible, uh, I want to encourage you to open it up or maybe an app on your phone. Open it up to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. That's where we're going to kind of camp out today. And, and, and as we open up to 1 Corinthians 1, let's see what Paul has to say about division in the church. Beginning in verse 10, <coughs> he writes this. He says, Brothers and sisters, I encourage all of you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to agree with each other and not split into opposing groups. I want you to be united in your understanding and opinions. Brothers and sisters, some people from Chloe's family have made it clear to me that you are quarreling among yourselves. And this is what I mean. Each of you is saying, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I follow Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in Paul's name? Now, unfortunately, what's happening in this passage has been happening ever since. And using this... Uh, passage as an anchor, I'd like to look at some uh, of, of the problem here in Corinth. You know, it's the disease of, of disharmony and, and division. And so I want to look, first of all, at, at the reasons for division, and then the results of division. And finally, I want to look at a biblical response to division in the church today. So first, let's look at the, the reasons for division. Now Paul originally planted the church in Corinth. And, and then Apollos came on, along later on and, and grew it into this big mega church. And at some point, Peter came through and preached a revival. Three dynamic leaders, all of whom loved the Lord, 
accidentally develop their own little followings. The Christians in Corinth chose their favorites, argued about who had more authority, who was the best preacher, who converted the most disciples, etc., etc. And eventually, just like in Captain America's Civil War, lines were drawn, sides were chosen, and the first primitive denominations were formed. What I find most compelling, though, is, is that these opposing groups forming in Corinth had nothing to do with doctrine. You know, Paul, Apollos, Peter, Jesus, they all preached the same principles. I mean, they taught the same tenets of Christianity. The divisions in Corinth had nothing to do with, with theological issues. Rather, it was all about personal preferences. They split the church over matters of opinion. They weren't even matters of faith. And unfortunately, it's often the same way today. <coughs> Sorry, I'm probably going to do that a few more times before I'm done up here. Churches uh, and unfortunate, that unfortunately suffer internal conflict and eventual splits are pretty common these days. Studies indicate that there are about 19,000 major scarring church conflicts in the United States each year. That's about 50 per day all over the country. And most of our numerous denominations were formed through these not-so-friendly church splits down through the decades. Most of the church splits lately have nothing to do with theological issues. According to Church Conflict Forum, only about 2% of the church conflict is over doctrinal issues. The other 98% was over interpersonal issues. Just getting along with the person in the pew beside you. Some churches have split over the color of the carpet. One church split over a piano bench, and literally the way they resolved this was to take the piano bench out for the first service and bring it back in for the second service. One church split over the spelling of the word hallelujah. Ask three people how to spell it. And I'm not making this stuff up. My personal favorite story is the, the Presbyterian church splits in the little town of Centerville, Georgia, Population of about 5,000 people. It all started with, with one original Presbyterian church that had internal conflict around 1911. And, and the conflict was over whether to take up the collection before the sermon or after the sermon. That's what they, their original church split was over. And the splitting off church became the Centerville Reformed Presbyterian Church. Just four years later, another church split occurred over whether or not to have flowers in the sanctuary. And the church that split off then was renamed the Trinity Reformed Presbyterian Church of Centerville. A total of seven more splits happened between 1915 and 1929 over various issues. And by 1931, the latest addition was named the Third Westminster Trinity Covenant Presbyterian Reformed Church of Centerville. And I'm just getting started. More church splits have occurred since then, bringing the total number of Presbyterian churches in Centerville to 48. 48 Presbyterian That's a world record, by the way, for the most number of churches from the same denomination in the same town. The most recent split in Centerville was over whether or not it was a violation of the Sabbath to check your email on your personal computer at home. The church split over that issue and some folks left the, I have to take a deep breath here, 2nd Second Second Street, 1st, 9th Westminster Covenant Reformed Presbyterian Church and renamed the new church the Presbyterian Totally Reformed Covenantal Westminsterian Sabbatarian Regulative Credo Communist Amillennial Presuppositional Church of Centerville. A teaching elder named Paul Davis from the PTRCWSRCCAPCC, yeah, I got that right, was quoted saying, I think we finally got it right now. We have a church with 100% doctrinal purity. We're up to six people on Sunday mornings. I know that numbers are not important, but we're hoping to grow a little bit. 
And we can all get a good chuckle out of stories like that, but the sad fact is that it demonstrates what happens when we major in minor issues. Paul put his finger on the problem when he writes to the same group of people later in chapter 3. He says, you are still not spiritual because there's jealousy and quarreling among you. And this shows that you're not spiritual. You're acting like people of the world. It was their immaturity, this quarreling, this jealousy that led them to be who they are. And then James writes similarly in James chapter 4, verse 3. He says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Aren't they caused by the selfish desires that fight to control you? Are there legitimate theological or biblical grounds for, for churches to break off? Yeah, I suppose there probably are some. Martin Luther came up with a list of 95 of them and nailed it to the front door of the Catholic Church in Wittenberg. But I don't think there's nearly as many as we seem to act like there are. The vast majority of divisions and splits in the church are caused by jealousy, selfishness, and immaturity. That's how it was in Paul's day, and that's still has how it is in our day. Now let's consider the, the results of this division. Take another look at the results uh, of Corinth's quarreling and what happened to that church. In the next verse, uh, verse 10 through 13 again, actually, this is just 13. It says, This is what I mean. Each of you is saying, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I follow Christ. Has Christ been divided? See, according to, to Scripture, there's only one body, one universal church, which is the body of Christ. It consists of every believer. Every person that has put their faith in Jesus. But when we split into opposing groups like the Corinthians did, we tear the body of Christ apart. And unfortunately, we've been doing it for centuries. In Frank Mead's Handbook of Denominations in the United States, he lists and describes over 200 different religious groups or denominations in America today. And the word denomination, by the way, is a Latin term that means to name which is exactly what the Corinthians were doing. They were taking the names of their chosen leader. And Christians have been following their example ever since. You know, We say, I follow Luther, or I follow Wesley, or I follow the Pope. Now, I have a friend who swears that Jesus was a Baptist. And the ironic thing is that, that just like Peter, these great leaders often discouraged people from following them. Martin Luther himself once said, I ask that men make no reference to my name and call themselves not Lutherans, but Christians. What is Luther? My doctrine, I'm sure, is not mine, nor have I been crucified for anyone. No, no, my dear friends, let us abolish all names and call ourselves Christians after Him whose doctrine we have. See, and other great leaders like, like Wesley and John Wesley and Charles Spurgeon have said similar statements about the Methodist Church and the Baptist Church. But don't think that we get off the hook because we call ourselves the Christian church. I mean, notice that Paul even criticized the group that said, I follow Christ. He just lumped them in there with the other three, right? See, there's, there's nothing wrong with just following Jesus. I mean, that's what we should be doing. But this faction had become so exclusive and elitist that they didn't accept any of the other groups as genuine Christians. They weren't promoting peace and harmony, and so they were just as guilty as everybody else of tearing apart the body of Christ. In uh, the climax of Marvel's Civil War comic book series, and I'm sure the movie will be different, so I'm not giving anything away, Captain America stands over Iron Man ready to deliver a, a crippling blow when all of a sudden firefighters and EMTs and police officers tackle Captain America and pin him down to the ground. And... And he was just shocked that these everyday ordinary heroes were turning on him. And he didn't understand why. And it wasn't until that moment that he looked up and he, he saw the, the damage that they had been dealing to New York's landscape as they fought amongst themselves. And tears welled up in his eyes and he said, my God, they're right. We're not fighting for the people anymore. We're just fighting. And when I look at the, the landscape of Christianity today, I wonder if the same is true of us. 
You know, it's one thing to contend for the faith. It's another to be contentious for the faith. You know, it's one thing to stand up for Jesus. It's another thing to stand up for my particular set of narrow views and interpretations of Scripture. One is good and noble and the other is just divisive. When Christians fight amongst themselves, it creates chaos and, and confusion, often leaving broken lives and, and broken churches in their wake. So what can we do about it? Well, finally, let's look at Paul's response to this division. How did Paul respond to the situation and how do we respond today? Well, Paul pleaded with the Corinthians in verse 10 saying, I beg you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with each other and not be split into groups. I beg that you be completely joined together by having the same kind of thinking and the same purpose. Now, of course, this is a lot easier said than done. Now, I don't believe it's possible for us to always agree about everything, but I do believe it's possible to disagree without dividing. And Paul demonstrates how to do that all throughout this chapter. Even though the groups in Corinth had, had been divided and discordant, you'll notice that two times in this passage, in, in the verses that we just read, he calls them brothers and sisters. Verse 10 and verse 12, he calls them all brothers and sisters. And at the beginning of the chapter, he addressed this whole book to the church of God in Corinth. Singular, the church of God. In Corinth. And then he reminds them in verse 2 at the opening chapter, he said, God made you holy by means of Jesus Christ, just as he did for all people everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Their Lord and ours. See, in other words, nobody has an exclusive claim on Christ or on Christianity, until we start accepting one another as fellow Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, the church will never experience the unity that Jesus prayed we would. Now Jesus once said in, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, He said, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. In other words, united we stand, divided we fall. And the kingdom of God should never be divided. Jesus also reminded His disciples in Mark chapter 9, verse 39 and 40, He said, whoever is not against us is for us. Another translation, the message puts it this way, it says, if He's not an enemy, He's an ally. And we need to realize that no matter what the sign says above the door, the church down the street is not the enemy. They're our allies. Paul gives us the key to, to fellowship and acceptance in his letter to the Romans. In Romans 15, verse 7, he says this. He says, Therefore, accept each other in the same way that Christ accepted you. Now, that's a pretty tall order. I mean, Christ didn't expect you to have a, a complete knowledge of New Testament eschatology when He accepted you. you know, he didn't expect you to, to have formulated all of your opinions about women's role in the church or about when communion should be served or, or when to take up the offering or have you pick out the color of the carpet before He accepted you. He didn't insist that you, you have a complete understanding of church organization or eternal security or the role of the Holy Spirit before He accepted you. He didn't ask you to confess your faith in any particular doctrine or creed. Jesus accepted you based on your faith in Him. That's what He accepted you on. Your, your faults, your failings, your misunderstandings, all of your opinions, whether they're good or bad, stupid or intelligent, Jesus accepted all of them because you put your faith in Him. Warren Wearsby comments on this verse. He said, it's not our responsibility to decide the requirements for Christian fellowship in a church. Only the Lord can do this to set up man-made restrictions on the basis of personal prejudices or even convictions is to go beyond the Word of God. He concludes, because God has received us, we must receive each other. In the words of St. Augustine, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, love. 
That's really the key. Genuine love means accepting each other. Too many Christians are willing to lay aside the, what, what Jesus called the great commandment to love one another in order to divide over these secondary and tetrarchy issues. You know, we're, we're commanded to accept each other the same way that Jesus has accepted us with love and open arms. Now I'm sure, at least I hope, that by the end of Captain America Civil War, just like with Batman vs. Superman, the superheroes will overcome their differences and unite against a common threat for a common good. And I just pray that we as Christians will do the same. Because on the night before Jesus was crucified, He prayed that all of those who would ever believe in Him would be one. And just as, as He and the Father are one. And in this case, it's actually you and me who get to answer Jesus' prayer instead of the other way around. So let's be the answer to that prayer. This morning I want to offer a special invitation. If you, if you have a brother or sister in Christ with whom you've had conflict or you're at odds with, I want to encourage you to go to that person today. Let them know that you love them, that you accept them, and that no matter what your differences are, your brothers and sisters in Christ, your family, and that's what matters. If you need help with that or you just need someone to talk to about a painful skirmish and conflict in your life, then come forward and talk with me while we stand and sing. Let's sing together, church.